Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I don't think as lift people we were particularly aware of mobility scooters until the year 2010. Uh, well, I've already made a mistake because if we're here in the UK, um, legally, there's no such thing as a mobility scooter. These are all simply invalid carriages. So let's, let's get our terminology right. We became aware of invalid carriages after an accident in uh, Berlin in May uh, 2010. Uh, LZG um, was a, a diabetic double uh, amputee who'd been out in a mobility scooter shopping one morning and started to feel unwell. She realised that she'd not taken a medication and so she decided the best thing to do would be to get home as quickly as possible. So she put her scooter onto full speed, got onto the road and started to get uh, home as quickly as she could. The block of flats that she lived in had automatic doors and by the time she'd turned into the, the um, entrance to the block of flats, she was starting to, uh, to pass out. D didn't stop the mobility scooter which went straight through the front doors and then straight into the lift doors and there she fell down the shaft. Um, she was rescued by the fire service and all the, with fairly extensive injuries. She, she survived that, that particular accident. Um, the next one, and I, I apologise profusely in advance, this is the only video I was able to capture of this particular incident. Its quality is poor and there's a rather inappropriate uh, ending to it which my limited um, ability with uh, multimedia technology hasn't allowed me to edit out so I, I do apologise in advance for the bad taste of that. Here's the incident in South Korea later in, in August the same year. Lady gets into the lift in a shopping centre, uh, obviously a scenic lift, she's looking over the shopping centre, she's, uh, she's put a call on but she's not satisfied with that so she returns and registers the call again. The doors start to close and there comes Mr Lee. He'd been screaming, hold the lift, hold the lift and being ignored. He sees the lift disappear and he's cross. So he has another go. And this time, as you can see, the right hand door panel's gone. And then on the second occasion, both panel goes and there he goes down the hole. And he's killed. That, that's, he, he falls. I'm sorry, that's, that's, the, that's the bit I was trying to edit out. <laughs> um, so, two incidents. Does that mean we now have to change all of lift design? Does the industry have to stand on its head for two isolated incidents? Well, probably you might think not. Um, however, by the end of this year, there'll be half a million mobility scooters in the UK, which is a lot of scooters. The reason for the growth of this, which won't stop at the end of this year, is that things have become significantly cheaper. In the old days, invalid carriages, you remember invalid carriages, those of you who are old enough to remember the things, you usually had a Greaves engine and, and they were, they, they looked a bit like Daleks, but were a bit, a bit fatter. And, and invariably, the person that got out of them had a Raynaud on, and, and, and one, one of those Danny Max or something, that, that's the image I always have of those things. And there were, there were a few of them about, but not many, because they were vastly expensive. Well, these aren't. These are now made mainly in China. Um, so we've got the low cost. We've got an ageing population uh, becoming increasingly obese. Um, so we are likely to be in a situation m more of this type of incidents are likely to occur. So... This time last year we had a paper um, that um, was put on about selecting the right doors for, for a particular application and, and one of the delegates uh, made the point, well look if you know there are mobility scooters about, why aren't we designing doors that cope with those sort of forces? And one of our eminent contributors 
said, no, it's impossible. You, you, you couldn't possibly cover those forces. And so I immediately thought to myself, well, if, we, if we're talking about forces that we can't control, sounds a bit more like Doctor Who again, doesn't it? Um, what, what are they? So I, I started to do a, a little bit of research. Class 3 invalid carriages, the, these are the bigger mobility scooters that we see. So these are the ones that are designed to go on the road and, and that look you know, a bit more like a, a full-size thing rather than a tiny little scooter. They are capable of, let's, we lift people, so let's stick to metres per second, never mind miles an hour or kilometres per hour. 4.16 metres per second and the accelerate to this speed at an acceleration of about uh, 3.33 metres per second squared. How do I know that? Well, um, Thomas Lernert, who previously was with Myla, now he's head of door uh, systems research for, for Vita, has carried out uh, lots of tests using um, rapid uh, video uh, to, to track uh, acceleration. I, I had, I had a, a simpler way. I, I used my vibration analysis machine, shoved it in the back of my mate one-legged rods mobility scooter, and then after a couple of pints, we raced it up and down the car park of the pub <laughs> and, and, and seen what the acceleration was. Now, it might not be entirely scientific, but what I can tell you, it was remarkably consistent that we had a perfectly linear acceleration of... Uh, about the same figure that, that uh, Lerner had come up with, uh, 3.33 metres per second squared. So I'm fairly clear about what the acceleration can be on, on these things, and that's on full speed, by the way. So if, if we're looking about force, then I think we probably all remember what used to be called O-level physics when I was a lad. Force equals mass times acceleration. We, we know what the acceleration is, so what about the mass? Well, the government's jumped in. Uh, they've actually changed the law now to say that you can have a carriage which will weigh up to 200 kilograms with medical equipment. It, should be un it used to be 150 kilograms until March this year, but they should, well, no, if you need oxygen cylinders, you can have another 50 kilograms. It's a hell of a big oxygen cylinder. Mm -hmm. But it, under UK law, then the passenger cannot weigh more than... 150 kilograms. However, under the mobility scooter European standard, then the passenger can weigh up to 300 kilograms. So in theory, if, if we were taking the worst case scenario, we could have a total mass of half a ton in old money. Now, there are other methods of computing uh, the, the force that's applied and, and the one that's used, for instance, if you are designing um, balustrades in car parks or, or railings in car parks, you use this particular formula where what it does is it looks at the energy but then divides it by C and B where C is the, um, the deformation in millimetres of the scooter, I, the, the, the vehicle, and then B is the deformation of whatever you're hitting into the barrier or the door. Well, most mobility scooters have, have got a fairly serious bumper at the front. It's, it's generally speaking either a, a flat bar or, or it's a piece of 25 mil round bar that's solidly fixed. And at the speeds we're talking about, there may be some deflection, but I've no idea how you'd measure it. And I think it, it's, it's pretty academic. Door panels, by and large, if, if we're in a centre opening door situation like we had with our friend in South Korea, um, we, we ought to be able to deform that by five millimetres because that's a typical door clearance and we ought to be able to get that again before the doors have actually ended up into the running clearance. So, so we ought to be able to see that and we probably will see that on a light duty door. So what that does when we add the sums up is it means that we've got somewhere in the region of 867 newtons. So we've now got some figures to work with. If, if, if the world was really, really bad, they had the fattest man in the world driving the heaviest mobility scooter at full speed, and he went smacking into a door which deflected five millimetres, that's, that's the force. The energy is 
easier still because it's basically the same formula without the, its mitigation. Um, but that's a lot. Look at the kinetic energy. We've got 4.4 roughly kilojoules. So what, we, what I think we know now is the trick is in the design of the doors and the design of the mobility scooter. If, if we want to accommodate that, if we want to produce a safe system, then it's got to be in, in those two parts of the components. But of course, we've also then got to start looking at the design of the building because what's abundantly clear from all of this is although we we're looking at acceleration, it's not the acceleration that does the damage, it's the velocity. So if we've only got a limited space to accelerate up to a speed, then we'll never hit that full speed velocity. And, and in most cases indoors, we, we ought to be able to control that by building design. I'm not going to go through the whole of this. This is just a, a, a cut and paste job out of EN8120. And the, the good news is it's better than EN81's 1 and 2. So we've improved the strength of doors and, and lift cars, etc. And we've taken the static force from 100 newtons up to 300 newtons. So basically, EN81 is saying 300 newtons evenly distributed over an area, which incidentally isn't so far different to what you might expect the impact to be from a mobility scooter. And then if we look at a static force, then we've got uh, a kilonewton and 353.16 joules, which is a soft pendulum. So those are the forces that EN81 in its ordinary form considers. But really EN81 in its ordinary form isn't considering forces from abuse when we want to look at forces from abuse, we need to look at EN8171. And when we look at that in category one, we're looking for 309 joules. Category two, 442 joules, with a retaining force of 618 joules. So if we've got something that's designed to retain within 618 joules, then the 800 joules that we've got in the worst case scenario is only a little bit more than that. So we're not, we're not as far away from being able to accommodate the worst case scenario. We haven't got there, but we're not, we're not far from it. What strikes me about this is, if, if you re put your mind back to the Mr. Lee and his mobility scooter in his shopping centre, and he's racing towards the doors of this lift. But if he'd have got his steering wrong a bit and he'd have gone into the glass balustrade, it'd have been safe. Because we test glass balustrades in Atria to a far higher standard. You, if, if, you, if you're putting a glass balustrade in Atria, for every metre, you've got to put 1.5 kilonewtons. And, and there are test rigs and they actually go and do it uh, as, as, the, as the thing's installed do lots of jobs in uh, that, that sort of retail environment. I've, I've, I've seen it happen. So if he'd have run, run into the balustrade, he'd have been all right, but he isn't in the door. So the lift doors are weaker than, than, than the balustrades around. And, and that seemed to me to be absolutely wrong. The other absolutely stupid situation is that the mobility scooters that are built to the European, British and European standard go faster than is allowed under UK law. So you go buy from your lo local mobility centre a scooter, take it out onto the highway, after approximately two seconds, if you've got it on full speed, you're going faster than you're allowed to go. So you're in a vehicle that no longer qualifies as an invalid carriage you now should have it MOT, tax tested, and, and, and have a driving license, none of which are a requisite of an invalid carriage. So between all of this, to me, there's something wrong. But let's be a bit more pragmatic. Most mobility scooters that are sold in the UK actually only weigh about 120 kg, much less than that in most cases. 60% of mobility scooters sold in the UK are what they call the car boot design. 
So the idea is you keep it in your car boot, when you get to the shops, you lift it out, put it on the floor, and you ride it. Well, you're not going to start lifting 120 kilogram. So they, they must weigh 20 kilograms, perhaps, at a maximum. The big ones will weigh up to 120 kilograms. And although the designer should be de designing up to 300 kilograms as a maximum, most, when you look at the data from the manufacturers, and I guess I've looked at perhaps 10 or 15 different manufacturers, 220 kilograms seems to be the, 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 the actual maximum load that these things are designed for. And in truth, we're only supposed to be operating on full speed on a, on a public highway, on a road, not on a pavement, not in a shopping centre, not in a block of flats. These things are supposed to be running at 1.79 uh, metres per second. So if we go back to the, the previous formulas, mass times acceleration, then the, the maximum force using the simple Newton formula uh, is only slightly more than the static force that's required in in a 220 <coughs> Maximum energy is uh, 545 joules, and that's only a little bit more than, oh, it, it's less than uh, category two, but it's, it's less than, also it's less than the retaining force. So in the real world, the, the world of pragmatism, we haven't really got as much of a problem as we thought we had in the first place. <coughs> We've improved the strength of doors, or we will be improving the strength of doors to get to an 8120, but there's some simple changes that, that any manufacturer can make that could massively increase that. If we use stainless steel or cast iron door sills rather than aluminium, there's less chance of the, the sill flexing on under loading. We can beef up the door shoes and the fixings to door shoes. That's, that's one of the classic things that f for a period of time, door shoes were, were um, mounted onto um, uh, studs. that were, They were uh, just wet welded studs and, and those studs with a, with a sudden impact, can quite easily break off. So we can change that design. We can put retaining plates uh, located in between the door shoes to prevent the cap flapping effect. But a simple thing that I, I hadn't really thought of, but it <laughs> makes sense, is the, the, the main point of impact on, on a lift door, no matter how wide it is, because that's where you're steering for, is the centre of the door. So if you've got a two-panel side opening door, then the strongest point within that door structure is going to be there, smack in the middle. So two-panel side opening doors is going to be a better solution than centre opening doors. And I guess, had the lift that Mr Lee caused to run into had two-panel side opening doors, he'd have had to do it three or four times more before he'd have gone down the shaft. And, and it, with any luck, his battery might have run out. On a more, <laughs> let's call it, uh, innovatory idea, what if we, we, we have studs that go into the, the shaft wall that we put the brackets on to mount the door systems? Well, what if we had preloaded springs on those studs? Set up by a torque wrench, spring designed to accept the pressures. If you did then come and thump it, then most of the energy is going to be absorbed by the spring rather than by the door itself. And that would be a way of, uh, of causing that. Those of you who were at Augsburg last time round, where Myler had got the crash test dummy uh, repeatedly hitting the door for a period of about four days, um, what, what startled me was that the crash test dummy, inevitably, every two or third trip, ended up headbutting uh, the, the header of the architrave. And you think to yourself, well, wait a minute, this is all about safety. This is about stopping people getting injured. Well, in a right lot of good, making an absolutely rigid door system that ends up killing the passenger through, through head injuries, is it? You know, we, we've, not, we've not done anything if we do that. So it's got to be an appropriate solution. And of course, if we're going to do it to, to the doors in a, in a lift car, 
then what if the doors were open? What, what about the rear wall? We've got to do it to the walls as well. I don't know if you know this, but mobility scooters don't really have brakes. It's, it's the, just turn the power off and then, you know, the motor turns into a generator, turns into stopping the scooter. So th they don't stop straight away. It's a bit of a problem because that means that somebody who is waiting a couple of hundred mil or perhaps 400 mil from a lift door with the shopping basket, moves the shopping basket, catches the start button instantaneously, they're going to hit that door. Now, probably not with disastrous effect, but Southampton uh, Council, had, after the Southampton incident, um, had done quite a lot of research on this and found that there has been repetitive damage to doors caused by mobility scooter users. It wouldn't cost a lot of money to put a proximity sensor, would it, on, on the front of these things? So that when you got within, say, 200 mil of an object, it, it, it put the brakes on for you, it disconnected it. it just, just a simple, uh, like a parking sensor, but that actually cut out the, the force to it. At least then the thing's slowing down when you hit it. I think the big problem with all of this is what it says in the UK legislation is that a device shall be provided to prevent a lift, sorry, a lift, sorry, a scooter from travelling in excess of four miles an hour except on public highways. And all that they provide is a little toggle switch. You, you can turn it that way for slow, you can turn it that way for fast. Now, my mate Rod, he's never been on slow. He, everywhere Rod goes, he's on fast. And, and I guess that's everybody does that. So that needs to be changed. And if we want to stop further accidents, we've got to start changing mobility scooters as well. But do we want people to use mobility scooters in buildings? Well, if, if, if we can, and if we can stop people using mobility scooters in buildings, then that's what we should do. Let's take the problem away from the lifts. If we can't do that, what we need to do is we need to stop the being that full speed potential for hitting the lift doors like the LCG and like Mr. Lee. We need to have some way of limiting the speed that can be hit and that can be done by either creating lobbies uh, but also it can be uh, done by improving the resilience of, of any landing door systems. If it's bad for mobility scooters, what about places like hospitals and airports that have these huge vehicles that run around the place? Surely at some point in the future, those sort of buggies or whatever we want to call them, they're going to be involved in accidents with lifts. And we now know that, that those accidents can and do happen. So. With the growth of mobility scooter usage, the risk of accidents is going to increase. The government isn't doing anything about it. We've got an ageing population that means it's becoming a greater risk and our existing laws and standards don't particularly cover what's going on. The only people who are going to solve this problem are the people who design lifts, the people who design buildings. And, and so I, I, my view is that we need to start evolving lift, sis, lift door systems that will be sufficiently robust and for architects to get their head around the fact that these risks exist. It's particularly important where it is possible to get faster than 1.4 metres per second because thereafter, because velocity is squared, half mv squared, as we get much above 1.4 meters per second, then suddenly the energy starts to massively escalate. So that's, that's where we, we need to act. Reduce the speed and then you'll reduce potential for accidents. Thank you.